Good afternoon, Howard Wig, host of Code Green with Think Tech Hawaii. I have today as my temporary guest a fellow who may be known to you. His name is Jay Fidel. What he's doing is filling in for Mike Hamlet, who's running a little bit late. But Jay knows just a thing or two about Mike's passion, which is the Hawaii Energy Forum. Jay, would you tell us a th your take on Hawaii Policy Energy Forum? Because yeah. it's not exactly a household conversation. Hi, Howard. Nice. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me for the, <laughs> as a temporary <laughs> warm-up guest here. Mm -hmm. Well, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum is, uh, oh, must be, must be uh, something 13, 14 years old, something in there. And it was established uh, when the Clean Energy Initiative first got interesting, actually before 2008, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So clean energy was actually uh, of interest way before 2008. This organization started at the university. And it was a, sort of a consensus group established of stakeholders in clean energy, in energy in general, the idea being that we should all talk to each other and collaborate about the future of clean energy. And Mike was one of the originals, and he has been the co-chair of the clean energy, uh, Hawaii Clean Energy Forum for a long time. Um, the other co-chair is uh, Sharon Moriwaki, also of the university. So those guys have been, uh, you know, um, organizing the forum, organizing the programs, speaking at the programs, talking to stakeholders and constituents all these years. And they have created an organization that's a fair-minded, broad-based platform that reaches uh, consensus suggestions for the public and for government. So it's a, a moderating force, I would say, a very useful organization. It has, it has a long way to go um, in order to, uh, you know, do its job through the uh, trans transition, through the transformation of our uh, economy and our energy uh, initiative. And so Mike will be here in a minute. I feel certain that he's here already, as a matter of fact. And what you might do is take a short break uh, after I finish so he can talk more about the forum uh, and about the, um, about the barrel tax, which is his principal reason for appearing today. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a short break to greet Mr. Hemnet then. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month. Depends when we're busy. We get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics. We talk about healthcare. We talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Aloha. My name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ. And my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the island. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in, in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. My second guest of the day following the Honorable Jay Fidel is Mr. Mike Hamnett, who wears many hats, but today he is here as co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Jay Fidel described it as a broad, broad umbrella group that was founded by people at UH. And Mr. Hamnett, why don't you just take the ball, run with it, and begin by introducing the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, because it's not exactly a household name. No, the, and, um, yeah. the Energy Policy Forum actually came out of a, a proposal from uh, Ravi Am at Hawaiian Electric. Mm -hmm. he, was, he approached my predecessor at Research Corporation, which is where my day job is. And uh, uh, Ravi said, is there anybody at the university who could get all of the energy stakeholders together? Um, energy discussions in Hawaii had sort of deteriorated to food fights, either at the legislature or at the Public Utilities Commission. And there was a sense that underlying everybody's desire for their energy uh, agenda was a common set of uh, beliefs about what Hawaii's energy future should be. 
Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what Robbie said, you know, can, can we pull a group of stakeholders together <coughs> to kind of re-articulate a vision which I think has been articulated several times at the state level. It's in statute, was in statute at the time. Um, and to develop a, a, an agenda for moving the energy, uh, the energy agenda forward. And you know, for years everybody had talked about uh, the, the uh, vast array of renewable energy we had here in Hawaii, and yet we seemed stuck on oil and it was getting worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, Sharon Miyashiro and uh, John Harrison, who was at the Environmental Center, and um, uh, Rick Rochelo at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I dragged in Sam Pence, who was at the East West Center at the time, or Sam was an energy consultant at the time. And we sort of decided, we got a list of, I think it was 19 stakeholders at the beginning, and invite them to come as individuals representing their particular um, industry or their particular uh, environmental group or whatever. But a combination of uh, people within the energy industries, including the refineries and the regulated utilities, um, as well as the renewable energy uh, establishment, um, along with environmental groups, Hawaiian civic groups, uh, the business community, uh, and to, to facilitate development of a, of a vision statement for Hawaii's energy future, um, and then to develop a, a mission, sort of uh, a mission for the group that had been the forum that had been uh, gathered. Uh, and we decided we would we needed to get a common knowledge base, mm -hmm. uh, and so we commissioned uh, four studies and developed a fifth one: uh, hydrocarbon futures, um, renewable energy options, um, scope for energy efficiency and conservation, um, energy uh, regulation in Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, and then also. Uh, what was likely to be coming down in the way of greenhouse gas emissions regulations that were going to impinge on the energy future. So we commissioned those five studies. We had, with the money that we'd gotten from Hawaiian Electric and some money we'd gotten from DVET, we commissioned the five studies. And ironically, four of the studies were done by, by local people of sort of global um, reputation. Mm -hmm. So FAX uh, Energy Fisher Rockies group mm -hmm. were doing the hydrocarbon futures. We had uh, Kyle Dada from Rocky Mountain Institute did energy conservation and efficiency. We had uh, Warren Ballmeyer and, uh, and Tom Laudit did uh, renewable energy. And we had uh, Carl Friedman look at uh, energy regulation. And we brought in a guy who had been here in Hawaii at the East West Center, uh, Chuck, uh, Chaz Feinstein, to do the, uh, the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, regulations. We commissioned those five studies, and then we reviewed those with the, they came, the presenters, or the preparers came and presented to the forum. Uh, and we, we synthesized all of that, put it into a roadmap, which mm -hmm. Sam Pence authored, authored. And all this is on the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum website. And then uh, we held an energy summit in December mm -hmm. of 1993. And we expanded the group of 19 to about 103, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Senator Akaka keynoted the uh, keynoted the meeting, and we had working groups in the in the meeting, and basically reaffirmed what the uh, what the original 19 folks had agreed upon as a vision and a, and a mission for the forum, uh, and, and that was the beginning of it. And then we con reconvened the group after the summit and said, well, you know, what do you folks want to do? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to continue, or we just sort of put this out there, this uh, mission state, a uh, vision and potential uh, roadmap, and just leave it at that, or do you mm -hmm. want to continue? And, and like, like most good groups, they've decided that they, they needed to continue. Yeah, yeah. And so from there, um, we began meeting regularly. Uh, four times a year is what we I think we originally said. And we, we developed a governance structure. Um, and when we first talked about the governance structure, we wanted it to be a consensus-based organization, mm -hmm. uh, which is both its, uh, um, it, its, you know, its uh, sterling quality and its biggest flaw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, if, if you don't have a consensus, I speak from long, long experience, the people who feel left out or slighted are going to come in with both 
barrels blazing and they're going to shoot the thing apart. That's right. So you need the, that consensus as, as seemingly sloppy and slow as it might be, sort of like democracy. Uh, it is. You, you've, got to, you've got to bring all parties on board. And, um, you know, and we've, we expanded the group from 19. It's now, I think it's now 48. Uh, it's bounced up and down. Some people have come and some people have left. Uh, we've been for fortunate to have the chairs of both the House and Senate Energy Committees as members. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been fortunate to have uh, DBED as an active participant, the PUC uh, as an active participant, given their constraints as a regulatory body, uh, the consumer advocate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the four counties, uh, the U.S. military, the two refineries, the two regulated electric, or the four regulated electric utilities, the mm -hmm. TECO plus KIUC. Uh, and uh, we also have had member. we've got representatives in the business community, the sure. Automobile Association, uh, because uh, one of our failings, uh, and I, this is not just the forum, I think it's the state as a whole, is mm -hmm. to try to deal with the transportation issue. Mm -hmm. um, with electricity, it's kind of easy because we've got, uh, they're regulated by the Public Utilities Commission and they are a fewer number than the number of drivers that we have in the state of Hawaii. Yes, yes. So. Now let, let's start with uh, specifically with transportation because when I think about it, you've got jet fuel, you can't control the uh, airline industry. You've got automobiles, everybody in Hawaii loves their cars. The percentage of automobile ownership in Hawaii is higher, ironically, than, than that it is on the mainland. Yeah. Very, uh, despite the fact that we have a beautiful transport, public bus system, and we're constrained by an island. So uh, can, you, can you get people out of their cars? We tried that in the energy office. Carpooling didn't get anywhere many, many years ago. Then you've got your uh, diesel for trucks, and you've got your diesel for boats, and what in the heck do you do about transportation? It's been a yeah. it's been a problem yeah. that all mm -hmm. of us have. I mean, I was yeah. involved in the original Hawaii Integrated Energy Plan mm -hmm. back in the early mm -hmm. '90s, and transportation was a was a failing mission at that yeah. thing yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and and there's still um, recently DBED, and you, you probably know this better than me. I mean, they they've done a transportation charrette to look mm -hmm. at all of the things that you could possibly do in the transportation realm, and these are. All the things on their list are things that the forum has talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's car sharing, bike sharing, uh, rapid transit, uh, you know, biofuels for transportation. Uh, but it, it's the, the, probably the most significant difference looking, going forward and looking back mm -hmm. will have been the increase in the CAFE standards from the federal government. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of, I think the original Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, which Super, which succeeded the forum, didn't supersede it, succeeded the forum. Uh, I mean, they were looking early on at uh, electric cars and, mm -hmm. and hybrids as a, an answer, and, they've, and they have put charging stations out to, mm -hmm. to encourage electric, electric car use, and there are tax credits to encourage the, that, but it's still, it's a very slow slog, mm -hmm. and um, the, the percentage of, the penetration of both electric car, cars and even hybrids is much way behind what the Hawaii Clean Energy Goals were, mm -hmm. or Energy mm -hmm. Initiative Goals were originally. Yeah, I think there there aren't even 4,000 EVs on the road yet. I think that's right. Yeah. But the advantage of EVs, and you can probably know more about this than I do, is the fact that, number one, they're coming from electricity. The more renewables we have, the more clean energy is going into those EVs. And if you have your charging station at home, it can be a two-way street. Right. You can use the energy in your battery, and it, it will go into the home grid. And as I understand it, it can go into the uh, the main grid. It's that's theoretically yeah. possible. We, yeah. We don't have the kind of grids developed in Hawaii to mm -hmm. be able to take advantage of that. And until the, I mean, it's a really ch chicken and egg problem. Uh, in terms of providing the charging stations and infrastructure mm -hmm. for electric vehicles uh, and then being able to get people to buy the electric vehicles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which are which are at a premium I mean which cost more than, than standard vehicles 
and then having the, the smart grid available to take advantage of the, the battery storage capacity mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. electric vehicles. The other, the other thing we, I think a lot of us had hung our hats on and the, and the nail broke, uh, and that is uh, biofuels. Mm -hmm. As uh, mm -hmm. we were looking for a, a sort of a drop-in drop in substitute for gasoline, uh, and biofuel development uh, really has not gone anywhere in Hawaii, with the exception of uh, the, sort of the Hawaii biodiesel, biodiesel mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. uh, and the demand is for diesel alone is way beyond anything that they're able to produce. Yeah, yeah. As I understand it, well, just to back up with the biodiesel group, as I understand it, there are trucks that go around from one fast food outlet and one restaurant to another to another, and each of them has a grease trap. Yep. And what, in essence, you do, the driver does, is stick this big vacuum cleaner Hose. thing yep. into the grease trap, suck the grease out, take it to the biofuel facilities, and they separate the solids from the liquids. The liquids are nice, high-grade fuel, and I believe the customers for that are the bus, our bus system, uh, our city garbage trucks, and I think the military takes quite a bit. Is, is that a good so. summary? Of, uh, yeah, no, I think yeah. so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the Kellys, who have been involved in this yeah. biodiesel thing from the beginning and, and are the most successful in Hawaii, uh, they've been re relying on you know, used vegetable fat as their mm -hmm. feedstock. Um, in fact, one of those trucks was out next to the Pacific Hotel, uh, um, the uh, Pacific Grand Hotel this morning when I was going to the gym, mm -hmm. pumping the grease out of the cheeseburger, cheeseburger place. <laughs> but yeah, they're 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 around. But th that's you know that's a limited amount of mm -hmm. um, supply. The the other the other hope is that um, biofuel co uh, crops mm -hmm. would be able to uh, through either uh, some sort of a catalytic conversion process using a gas of gasifier and a, and a catalyst to convert it to, and as I understand it, you can convert it to a bio, biodiesel product. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we've not developed any uh, uh, biofuels here that are really uh, at commercial scale at all. There's experiments going on, mm -hmm. and uh, some quite successful, but it's just nothing's ever got to the volume. And it, personally, and I've, I've said this when we, we commissioned the, the biofuels master plan from the university, the forum uh, was originally involved in the specs for that, Mitch Ewan. Um, and that is, if you took all of the arable land that we have mm -hmm, here in Hawaii, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, I did a calculation once for a talk I did on Maui, and you, and you used all of that to, to grow uh, biofuel crops, and you had a, a process to be able to consolidate the biofuel and convert it into a, a biodiesel, for example. I think the calculation was you could probably produce one quarter of the transportation liquid fuels needs for, mm -hmm. for Hawaii. I think that's what was in the, the 2050 and, report. And meanwhile, you would take out, use prime ag land that's growing a lot of our own vegetables and, and fruits now yes. and do that. Yeah. I remember yeah. uh, when uh, uh, Governor Abercrombie was in the was a congressman. He had had Colin Peterson come out here from the House mm -hmm. uh, Agriculture Committee, and he gave a talk to the forum. And we had a little roundtable discussion at the end of that uh, talk. And I said, I said, uh, Representative uh, Peterson, we've had a sugar industry in Hawaii. We're quite successful at making sugar. Uh, and the question is, does it make more sense to, to use that sugar land, use the sugar that's being produced to make fuel, or is it make make is it more financially advantageous to, to make sugar, he said, you will never be able to sell the mm -hmm. sugar crop uh, to make fuel and make more money than you make sugar. Sugar is going to yep. be so much more yep. profitable. Absolutely. And we had a thriving sugar industry Very way good. back when, and we used the fiber. We chopped up the fiber, dried it out. That was bagasse, and that went into power plants. We're still doing so, that on Maui. <laughs> yep. Uh, it, it used to be on uh, most of the islands, and it was a good chunk, so we actually went backward there. Yeah, the other, the other calculation, when the f biofuels issue first came up when, in the early days of the forum, Sam Pence, who's an energy economist friend of mine, worked on the forum early on. Uh, Sam took a look at some studies that have been done by UH, and they looked at uh, Jack Ciderhouse at the College of Business had been involved in evaluating a, a Banagrass proposal for mm -hmm. biofuels for the Big Island, for the Kaulu area. 
And you know, it's a, it's a dry land crop and didn't require a lot of irrigation. It was something you could do. And uh, when we first started looking at it, uh, uh, the Jack Ciderhouse, the economist from his College of Business, said, you know, we can't make that pay. It just mm -hmm. doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah. So Sam, Sam ran the numbers. And to, to directly burn the banner grass was a better, was more efficient mm -hmm. than converting it to a liquid fuel. Yep. And yep. in fact, when Jack said you can't make it pay economically, well, you can unless oil is more than $42 a barrel. Mm -hmm. Then it makes sense. Yep. And on that cheery note, we need to take a break. Think Tech Hawaii will be back in a moment. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Good afternoon again, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii Code Green. My guest today is Mike Hamnett, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. We've been talking about transportation and the great challenge that that poses regarding achieving a more sustainable, clean energy future. Maybe a much easier topic or more promising topic is the barrel tax. Mike, why don't, uh, barrel tax is not on exactly on everybody's tip of their tongue. Why don't you describe the barrel tax and, and your uh, take on it? Yeah, um, in, I think it was in 2009, uh, Hermita Morita, who was then chair of the House mm -hmm. Energy Committee, uh, talked about the idea of imposing a, a, a tax on every barrel of petroleum, and it ended up being petroleum products. And there was a five cents a barrel uh, tax on uh, on petroleum, uh, which became which which fed into the uh, sort of emergency response fund mm -hmm. for oil spill cleanup, and that funded the state's uh, ability to go out and uh, basically monitor oil spills and, and to require cleanup of responsible parties. That had been on the books for quite a while. And then Mina proposed adding a dollar and making it a tax of a dollar five. And, and her intent was to uh, use this money to foster sustainability and self-sufficiency in energy and food. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, the original uh, division was it was to be uh, 40 cents would go to the state energy office to promote energy sustainability. And 40 cents would go to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and uh, then I think it was uh, 10 cents went to Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, which does research in support of mm -hmm. energy self-sufficiency in Hawaii. And then I think it was uh, 15 cents went to um, went to the uh, energy um, uh, emergency fund. I think that was the original breakdown. Uh, the year it was passed, the uh, state was in a money crunch. Mm -hmm. And 60 cents of the barrel of the barrel tax dollar five was, was put into the general fund. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that remains uh, the formula up until today. Uh, we had, uh, as we do every year, the Energy Policy Forum um, sponsors of a, a energy briefing for the state legislature. And one of the topics that was on the agenda for that meeting was the barrel tax. And there is a bill uh, that's been introduced. Uh, I think it's, it's in play from last year. Uh, uh, Senator Gabbard is, is championing, championing it along with uh, Representative Lee. Mm -hmm. And that is to repurpose the 60 cents that's been going to the to the uh, energy, uh, going to the uh, general fund and divide that and give it to the, to the energy office and the Department of Agriculture. Um, and, and, and we did, I did a, a little review of all the things that had been accomplished just with the energy, uh, uh, the energy money, not the, six, not the whole amount, but mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the then 15 cents, which has been going to the, going to the uh, uh, energy office as well as to uh, the um, uh, 
uh, Department of Agriculture. And, and I look specifically at what HNEI, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, had mm -hmm. done with their money and what the Energy Office had done. Uh, and the Energy Office for many years, and Howard, you know this much better than mm -hmm. me, uh, lived off uh, uh, federal money mm -hmm. that was uh, excess profits tax that was imposed on the oil industry years mm -hmm. ago. And that was then um, given out to the states to, to run their energy operations. And the vast majority of the money needed to support the uh, state energy office came out of that federal money. Well, that was, that was drying up. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the, part of the impetus for, for the barrel tax and for the allocation of the money to the energy office was to help to keep the energy office afloat. Mm -hmm. Um, and for, you know, for those of you who don't know about the State Energy Office, it's worth looking at their website to see the, pro the programs they have, they have been promoting. Uh, and they've been, they've been very successful in terms of promoting uh, renewable energy, particularly in the electricity sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the most, uh, I, th I think personally, one of the most productive ones was the technical assistance that was provided to private companies that wanted to uh, start um, energy uh, independent power producers to, to, to promote or to, to uh, develop renewable energy projects to be able to sell power to the, to the grid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Colin Black there, I think that's who's there, is it? Not, not, not sure. Anyway, but they, they were really quite successful in, in getting uh, companies aware of what was required mm -hmm. both in terms of environmental regulation as well as uh, business regulation in Hawaii. And at one point they had 62 separate renewable energy projects kind of at some stage of development, either uh, looking for land, waiting for permits, waiting for investment, or, or, or sort of up off the ground. And a lot of the, the renewable energy projects that have been used to bring us actually ahead of schedule in, again, just in the electricity sector, ahead of schedule in meeting our mm -hmm. renewable portfolio standards, which were adopted by the legislature. Uh, we're actually ahead of the 2015 schedule mm -hmm. on our trajectory mm -hmm. to have 40% uh, renewable energy by the year 2030. Um, I understand that the, that the next step along, the, the 2020 uh, milestones are a bit more of a reach, but uh, but I gather things are, are moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. So the barrel tax, we had proposed to repurpose the, the money that was going to the general fund. Um, I'm not sure how far we're going to get with that because the, uh, the chairs of the two money committees in the legislature were at the forum meeting mm -hmm. and they were the last speakers at the uh, energy briefing, uh, the legislative briefing. And they basically said money is short, uh, everybody wants to get a piece of the barrel tax, and so uh, we don't think it's very likely we're going to be able to do that this year. Um, I had heard from uh, legislative staff that uh, some members of the, le of the energy committees are very bullish on trying to get that money mm -hmm. re-diverted back to the energy office and to, uh, to the Department of Agriculture. Of course, the advantage of re-diverting the money to energy plus ag is that number one you are creating a whole lot more jobs say just the the pv industry photovoltaic industry for a while it was the dominant portion of the construction That's industry right. and my field energy efficiency we've got hundreds of energy efficiency people earning good wages out there and every time you develop new renewable sources or decrease existing use, you reduce the amount of oil imported into the state, those dollars stay in the state and more jobs are created. And then from the agricultural standpoint, the same principle, you have more people out there in the fields producing locally grown produce, which generally is a lot healthier, a lot cleaner, certainly a lot fresher, you're creating jobs and you're decreasing the import of fuel, of, of uh, food. So you're keeping more dollars in the state. Now, it's yeah. an economic win uh, mm -hmm. all the way around, in my view. Uh, but it's a, but, uh, you know, I, I, and I'm already hearing things out of, uh, words out of the uh, new uh, 
uh, Ige administration about money being tight. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I gathered that what was uh, hoped to be a, an $800, $800 million surplus is apparently uh, uh, pretty well gone mm -hmm. as a result of uh, collective bargaining requirements and, and health benefit requirements mm -hmm. and that. Mm -hmm. So th they're saying the money is just not there. Uh, and that's, you know, another way of saying that is we don't want to use the money for that. We want to use the money for something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think a lot of the uh, emphasis this session is going to be balanced budget. Yeah, I think so, so too. Yeah. I think yeah. so too. Mm. Um, the, I mean, the other side, the other thing, uh, and again, this is where uh, the energy offices has been um, helpful, and Hawaii Energy. And that is um, trying to find ways to reduce the electric bills of the government agencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chancellor Strainey over in Hilo told me what I forget what huge, the huge bill for the uh, for the University of Hawaii at Hilo is, but it's it's very substantial. And Manoa is is even bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know I think the, between the Department of Ener the Department of Education, mm -hmm. the university, and the rest of, of state and county government, I would bet you that's. A, that there's a, a lot of money to be saved there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can speak with some personal experience to the 10 downtown state buildings. We had a program called Lead by Example, and we went into every one of those buildings, and the energy use in every one of them has decreased substantially. So that, that's a mini victory right there. Right, yeah. right. And, and you, you know, I think uh, your office, as well as Hawaii Energy, has been uh, very effective in convincing both private private businesses and government agencies that you know uh, s reducing uh, electricity consumption is is a way to increase your budget mm -hmm. basically and that's uh, that's where I think that like the barrel tax is a good investment yeah and it has to do with one of my favorite phrases namely culture isn't just important culture is everything and you and I have been around the energy field for long enough to go way back when, and when we were talking renewables and efficiency, we were voices in the wilderness. Now, it's the culture. There's a green culture out there. No matter who I talk to, they say, oh, yes, 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 yes. I was just in a uh, mom and pop store a couple of months ago, and the lady asked me what I did. And she said, oh, you know, we uh, have this old lighting system costs us so much. And look at our, all our refrigerators, see the leaking around the gaskets. But we don't have the money to get new one. And I said, let me introduce you to Hawaii Energy. Yeah. And one thing led to another. And sure enough, she got her new lighting and she got her new refrigerator cases. And her electricity bill dropped like a rock. Then it turned out that she teaches Korean dance. And a lot of her dance clients are likewise mom and pop shop owners. And she said, I'm going to tell all these people about this program. And apparently, it's just spreading like wildfire. And that's just a teeny, teeny little example of uh, what we've been able to do in conjunction with, with Hawaii Energy. And, and the yeah. thing is, that the fact that our uh, our electricity rates and even our, our gasoline prices are so high makes this probably the best place in the world to try to do uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy just because the comparison with with the cost of conventional energy are, are mm -hmm. relatively mm -hmm. lower than they are mm -hmm. in a place where you have low yeah, energy Absolutely, costs. yeah. Yeah, our electricity price is about three times what it is on the mainland. I had an interesting statistic, and I mentioned this on uh, Jay's other energy show on Wednesday. And I had heard, and I've yet to track this down, uh, when we first started the forum, I, I was looking at uh, household energy consumption. Mm -hmm. And, and they, there, there were rankings. And I think it was the Energy Information Administration had mm -hmm. state rankings. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those rankings was the percentage of household income devoted to uh, household energy and devoted to uh, household transportation. And even though we had the highest electricity rates in the country, we had we were among the lowest percentage of total household income devoted mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. electricity or to uh, to, uh, to gasoline. Yeah. And that's why I mean I remember when um, 
fuel, gasoline prices started to go up, I couldn't understand it. Why, why is demand dropping off? Mm -hmm. um, and it did drop off when we hit $4 a gallon, but it wasn't until then. But it's because it's not a very big bite out of people's pocketbook, despite the fact that it's one of the sorest subjects you can bring up mm -hmm. is increasing the cost of energy. Yeah, and this is one of the proud accomplishments that I, I can look at from uh, our office standpoint. The per household energy use today compared to 1973, I think it was when we started collecting data, is less than it used to be way back when, even though... With inflation. Uh, with inflation, even though way back when there was almost zero air conditioning in homes, now something like 25, 35 percent of all homes have air conditioning. Despite that, energy use has it's gone, gone down. down. It's uh, the homes are just so much more efficient these days. Uh, and witness on this island, Hawaiian Electric was able to close down the Honolulu plant and Honolulu power plant downtown. On the Big Island, I believe they have closed two. their two oldest uh, power plants. And that is real, real testimony to the Hawaii homeowners, number one, practicing efficiency, and number two, putting PVs and solar water heating on, on their roofs. The, uh, the other thing of the transportation, this is absolute heresy. If I were a politician, I would be strung up if I'd ever said this. <laughs> I mean, if we really wanted uh, energy consumption in the transportation area to drop, uh, we'd put a tax on gasoline uh, mm -hmm. to create a floor of about six dollars a gallon. So mm -hmm. it'd never get cheaper. If, if the oil prices ever drop below that, then there'd be an increase in the tax. But that politically, that would be absolute suicide for yeah. anybody to yeah. do that. But that would do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the best minds in the nation, uh, Th Thomas Friedman comes to mind, has recommended exactly that. But I remember years ago, I. Th I think it was Governor Cayetano was looking at five cents a gallon, and he immediately took that off the board. Yeah, that is just not a politically popular thing to do. So. Well, and the and the barrel tax, you know, mm -hmm. quite frankly, has been yeah. a success. I think the fact that that uh, sixty cents of the funding goes into the general fund is something that most people don't like. In fact, there was a survey done in two thousand three. I think it was Omnitrack did the survey. And uh, something like 70% of the people surveyed, it was a, a random sample, probably 600, 700 households, 70% uh, favored having the barrel tax be devoted entirely to self-sufficiency and energy mm -hmm, and food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, the culture shift. If you'd asked that question 20 years earlier, they wouldn't even know what you were talking right. about. Now everybody is on the green uh, bandwagon. And that's one of the things, certainly, that, that gives me hope. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm guardedly optimistic. Mm -hmm. And on that cheery note, uh, what we've talked about uh, difficulties with transportation and some of the uh, successes that we've had, what are those other successes in renewables or efficiency have you seen in your day, and, and what are you particularly pushing? Well, I mean, I think the energy, of the, I think Hawaii Energy has done a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. uh, and HECO did before them quite mm -hmm. frankly, their DS, uh, demand side management programs. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've seen success even in my own condominium. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, energy industries come out and do, a, <laughs> do an evaluation, and then we saved, you know, some huge percentage of our electricity costs mm -hmm. just by changing out one chiller and mm -hmm. the lights in the parking lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I, I think the energy efficiency thing is, and it's the cheapest and most cost-effective um, energy development there is, is the, is the uh, energy efficiency stuff. I think in renewables, I think we're kind of at a crossroads here, uh, and that is that we've had such screaming success with rooftop solar, with photovoltaics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 11% of the households, I don't know whether that's statewide or whether that's just Oahu, 11% of the households have, um, have rooftop solar. Uh, and we have some 40,000 rooftop solar sets in Hawaii. And that compares to something less than 3,000 in the whole state of Florida. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, that has been uh, a screaming success, and that dr driven part, uh, facilitated by the tax credits, mm -hmm. both at the state and the federal level, uh, but driven largely by the solar industry, which has heavily promoted both use of the mm -hmm. tax credits and sales of their photovoltaics. Yeah. 
um, how how much more and, and the the other the other problem is Hawaiian Electric has somewhat of a credibility problem because I remember years ago they said that we could never have any more than five percent of the households mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. photovoltaics and now we've got eleven percent and mm -hmm. people within the uh, uh, electric industries in the United States in the, on the mainland uh, tell Scott Sue and others at Hawaiian Electric it's technically impossible to put that much solar on mm -hmm. on the grid in the point mm -hmm. so I mean there, there the, I think this the the challenge is going to be to be able to put more on and it's it's and everybody talks about the smart grid and I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kauai Electric uh, Utility uh, Cooperative has moved have moved in that direction faster than Eco. Yeah. Eco is now doing some experimental work here on Oahu, uh, but I think trying to get trying to get you know uh, smarter a smarter grid. Uh, and to be able to wring as much firm energy out of the existing generation capacity we have here is something that we're, we're moving in that direction. And uh, how much further they're going to be able to go, I don't know. Um, I think um, the sale of uh, Hawaiian Electric Company and particularly the purchase by Nextera, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which has got a great track record of renewable energy, both wind and uh, wind, I think, largely. Uh, and, and using uh, storage technology on the grid to be able to take the peaks and valleys out. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got a good track record with that. But the, the, I, I know from friends in Florida, they mm -hmm. said that the energy, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was Florida Power and Light, which is a subsidiary of Nextera, who fought it in the legislature, but they fought uh, tax credits and feed-in tariffs and some of the things that we have here tooth and nail in Florida. Um, the words that we're getting out of the Nextera officials so far indicate that, you know, they're, they're going to be much more friendly to rooftop solar. But, but I, I know people in the rooftop solar industry are waiting with bated yes, breath to yes. see what happens there. Yeah, I, the, the solar people I talk to are a little on the concern side, to put it uh, mildly. Yeah. That's going to be a very, very interesting play out. Not just, I think, in the next year, but it may be a longer process than that. I think the PUC is going to be very, very, very occupied with this for a long time. Yeah, and it's going to be yeah. interesting to see what uh, Randy Iwasa, as the new chair of the PUC, yeah, is yeah, going to do yeah, with that yeah. hot potato. Mm -hmm. Well, on that cheery note, we have come to a close. Think Tech Hawaii Code Green guest, Mike Hamnett co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. See you next week. Thank you very much. Thanks.